in this letter, this epistle of James. And we're going to be in this through August. And before we get into the book, I want to dive into who the author is, this man named James. Because the truth is, if you really want to get to know somebody, you need to get to know them. You need to know to get to know their friends. And you also need to get to know their family. I mean, you really know someone, not just by hanging out with them, but you know them by who the friends are. But you also know them by who their family is. And so what, that's true of all of our relationships. And that's also true of our relationship with Jesus. If you really want to get to know Jesus, you're going to have to listen to him. You're going to have to learn from him. You're going to have to spend time with him. You're going to have to get to know his friends. The friends of Jesus in the Bible are called disciples or apostles, and many of them have written letters for us. The guys spent three and a half years with Jesus day in and day out. But you also need to get to know the family of Jesus. And that's what we're going to do this morning. We're going to get to know Jesus' family. And the truth is there's not a lot that's said in Scripture about the family of Jesus. In fact, there's not a lot mentioned about the early years of Jesus. Some of the early church creeds that were written to remind the church of what we believed only would say that Jesus was born of a virgin Mary, and then it would skip all the way to his death. They say he suffered, he died, and he rose again from the dead. They skip his entire life. He was born, he died. That would be a terrible obituary, right? Sam was born, he died. The end. But yet that's all the creeds had said because there wasn't a lot of information during those years where scripture says Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and favor with man and God. But you know who was there? His family was there. Jesus' family was there to see him as a little boy, as an adolescent, as a young man, as a grown man. If he had any sin, they would have seen it. And I don't know if you have family that love to expose how flawed you are, but I'm sure if there was sin in Jesus' life, his family would have said, this guy's a screw-up. This guy would have messed up, has messed up over and over. If there's any faults or failures or flaws in Jesus' life, his family would have been the ones to know. His family would have been the ones to tell. And they were there for years of his life before he was public, before he was famous, before he was well-known. They knew the most about him. And they saw him in the years where no one else had seen him. That being said, his family's testimony is incredibly helpful and insightful as we learn about this man, the most important man in the history of the world, the most significant man in the history of the world, the most worshipped man in the history of the world, Jesus. And so we're going to jump into the text today, and I think these guys wanted to challenge me, so they gave me one verse, and we didn't even read the verse today because it's that insignificant, um, and, and I think they were wanting to see if I can actually pull out of a message out of one verse. Um, and I, I think they were hoping I can finish this in five minutes, and that's not happening. And so um, James 1.1 1, 1 is our text. And the whole sermon today is going to be on this one verse, and we're going to do some other study on some related scriptures to learn about who James is. So James 1.1 1, 1 says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes dispersed abroad, greetings got a challenge of a passage to preach on for one verse. Um, so who's he writing to? It's passage says the 12 tribes. And if you know any Old Testament, you, when you hear 12 tribes, you immediately go back to the 12 tribes of Israel, the, um, the people, the nation of Israel, Old Testament language. James is writing to God's people. They're scattered. They're all over the region. They're all over the metroplex. And it's a network of churches that worship Jesus, but they worship in different locations. But they're all under the leadership of James. So here's James. Here's their senior leader. He's a teacher. He's a preacher. He's a writer. He has authority over all of these networks. They all have their individual pastors, but these pastors are being poured into by this man named James. And this message that he's giving is going to all of these churches. He's communicating to these group of churches that are around him. James is believed to be one of the first books that were written in the New Testament. And at this point in scripture, in history, most of the believers were of Jewish descent. Now, most of the believers are from Gentile descent, including us. But at that moment, it was mostly Jewish folks. 
And that's who he's writing to. A Jewish community that have recognized that Jesus is the Messiah, and they are following Jesus because, and to the, following Jesus to the point that they are now being persecuted for their faith. And James writes as a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he recognizes that Jesus is Lord. He's high. He's exalted. He's ruling. He's reigning in authority over all. He is the Savior who came to save us from our sins, and He is the Christ, the Anointed One of God. And so in these three titles, He tells us who Jesus is. He's the Lord who saves us and has chosen us by God the Holy Spirit to be empowered for a life that was perfect and without sin, that you and I may be saved through Him. But James says that He is a servant of Jesus. And I'm going to make the argument that James is Jesus' brother. And some would say, how would you know that? How do you know that this is Jesus' brother? Let me give you a few reasons. Number one, James didn't need to. Why didn't he say he was Jesus' brother? Why didn't he, in the text, say, hey, I'm James, the brother of Jesus? Here's the reasons why he didn't. Number one, he didn't need to. If you were Jesus' brother, you didn't have to walk around saying, hey, I'm the brother of Jesus, right? You didn't have to put that on your resume. He just had to say, I'm James. Everyone knew who James was. Number two, there was a lot of Jameses in the New Testament. And it often in Scripture would say, James, son of this guy, James, son of that guy. And it would, so they would recognize who that person was. Any times it says just James, this guy is so well known, you didn't need additional information. And number three, to say that he was Jesus' brother would almost give the impression that he was prideful. That he wants others to follow him saying, hey, I'm James. I'm Jesus' brother. You have to listen to me. And he doesn't do that because he wants to be like Jesus. We just learned this in the Gospel of John. Jesus was a servant. He was one who was willing to serve, and he's following Jesus' example, humility. So he doesn't go walk around and say, hey, I'm Jesus' brother. He might have said, yeah, maybe when we were smaller, me and Jesus used to share a bunk bed together. But when he was on earth, we would hang out. But now he's exalted in heaven, meaning he's Lord over me, and I'm a servant under him. Jesus is worthy. I'm nobody. And so he's following the example of his big brother, Jesus, who said that he didn't come to be served, but to serve. Jesus' example of servanthood, humility. And James is not only Jesus' brother. He's a disciple of Jesus. And he's following in the example of Jesus. He's basically saying, my job is to serve Jesus. My job is to elevate Jesus. My job is to make much of Jesus. That's why I'm here. James and Jesus were half-brothers. Same mother, different fathers. It was the first marriage of Jesus' mother and Joseph. They got married. And through the miracle of the Holy Spirit, the Virgin Mary conceived and gave birth to Jesus. After Jesus was born, they consummated their marriage, and they went on to have many kids. They went on to have a normal, loving marriage that produced a bunch of kids. They had a big family, and James was one of several brothers and sisters that Jesus had. And what you'll find is that when we, we learn a lot in the Bible, it's particularly in the New Testament of people like Paul or Peter, but you don't learn a lot about James except for a few verses here and there. But when we do learn about the family of Jesus, the spotlight often tends to go to Mary, the mother, the godly, devout, amazing woman of God. But sort of off to the side are the siblings, the brothers, the sisters, and very little is talked about them. Some of you have been going to church for a long time. And it might be a shock to you that you today that you are like, Jesus has brothers? Jesus has sisters? That might come as news to you. And so this morning, what I want to do is I want us to get to know Jesus' family for a little bit. So we're going to look at a bunch of different passages, um, and we're going to start off in Mark. And I can't cover every text that talks about Jesus' family. I'll cover some of them. And I just want to highlight some things as we go through these passages. The first thing we learn is Jesus' family, they didn't believe in him. Jesus' family disbelieved Jesus, Mark 3, 21. When his family heard it, they went out to seize him, for they were saying, he's what? He is out of his mind. His own family is like, this guy's lost it. And he's got our last name. He's, got, he's part of our family. 
We're embarrassed of him. His mother and his brothers come, and standing outside, they send to Jesus, and they call him, and the crowd is sitting there, and they say to Jesus, hey, your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. So early on, Jesus is preaching, he's teaching, and at some point, he has left his father and his mother. He's been working as a carpenter with his father for 30 years, and around the age of 30, he gets to the season at life, he's not a little boy anymore. Mom and Papa are kicking him out saying, go make a life, right? He's a grown man, single, living on his own, and he begins his public ministry. His family isn't with him consistently now. They're with him here and there. They're like, show up at the holidays, time together, you know one another, you love one another, your lives are intertwined. And yet none of Jesus' brothers are chosen as a disciple of Jesus. His disciples tended to be with him for full time for three years of his life. And the family, though, weaves in and out of his life for those three years. They will be there for events and special occasions. And here in this passage in Mark 3 is an indication of what they thought about Jesus. They thought that he was out of his mind. Because he kept saying that he was God. That he was a savior. That he was a creator. That he was a king. And his family was like, Jesus, our brother? And they were concerned. Listen, I've got one brother. And if he started saying that stuff, I would be like he's out of his mind, right? And if you have siblings, and if your sibling said that, you would be saying the exact same thing. They're out of their minds. I knew him when he was little. He is not a savior. He is not a god, right? And all of a sudden, this family, their brothers in the news, their brothers getting a lot of attention. Crowds are coming out to see him. The religious leaders are angry and want to destroy him. And people are listening to him. And what is Jesus saying? We learned a lot of what he said in the Gospel of John. He created the heavens and the earth. He's come down to judge the living and the dead. And the family are like, we've got to get him back home. We've got to lock him up. We've got to keep him away from people. We need to get Jesus some help. And so they inter- they're trying to do this intervention with Jesus. And that's important because some of you might have the same perspective of Jesus that his family did. A guy that says he's God? That's crazy. Jesus' own family started there. And that's okay. If that's where you are today, that's okay to start there. That's totally fine. But I want you to see the progression. And my prayer is that you would have the same progression. And what's important here is that we have to understand that Christianity is founded on the claim that Jesus is God. And some of you might say, well, that's a ruse. That's a shell game. That's put together by a con man, and his family was on it. But his family wasn't in on it. His family didn't initially believe that Jesus was God. They resisted it. They were concerned about it. But notice... His family genuinely loved him. They didn't just disown him and let him go. They show up. They were cared. There's a crowd there, and they're like, someone go get Jesus. Let him know his mom's here. His brothers are here. They love him. They're concerned about him. They're worried about him. You and I, we would call that an intervention. And if you're here, his claims to be God are either true or false. But Jesus made those claims. And his family knew that he made those claims. So the story continues over to Mark 6. James here dishonors Jesus. So there's this conversation going on. Is this not the carpenter, son of Mary? And here's some of his family members. The brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon and his sisters as well. Jesus and his mother. And they names four brothers. And you're going about his sisters as well. It's a pretty big family. Four, four kids are mentioned right there. Jesus makes fives. Sisters, there's at least two big fam- There's at least two sisters, and that's a big, big family. And they took what? Look at what the text says. They took offense. The next one, Mark 6. They were offended by some of the things that Jesus was saying. Some of you have been offended by things that Jesus said. Jesus said, I'm a prophet. And in the Old Testament Jewish mindset, when they hear Jesus a prophet, it's almost like, wait, prophets we know, Moses, Elijah, are you putting yourself on the same level as Moses? 
And that's what Jesus was doing. He's like, I'm like Moses, but I'm bigger than Moses. Moses in the Old Testament said a prophet would be coming. And Jesus is like, that's me. I'm here. And he says a prophet is without honor, is not without an honor except in his hometown and among his relatives and in his own household. Here's what Jesus is saying. He says, I'm going out. I'm preaching. I'm teaching. I'm doing everything that God is calling me to do. And lots and lots of people are coming to listen to me, but not my family. Not my family. My family doesn't support me. My family doesn't listen to me. They're like, I'm respected everywhere except with the people that are supposed to be the closest to me. And yet that's even true even today for some of you guys. You guys are trying to pour into your family members and you're trying to love on them and they don't listen. They, they tune you out. They think you're on a religious high and that you'll come back around and, and they, they don't listen to you. Can I encourage you that where you are today is exactly where Jesus was. His brothers, his family, his sisters didn't honor him. They didn't give him mind. Others were listening, but they weren't listening. Others were following, but they weren't following. He was dishonored by them. And so if you're here and you've been hurt because your family members don't pursue Jesus, even though you're trying to show them Jesus, let me encourage you. Jesus went through that as well. If you've ever been hurt because your family wasn't there for you, let me encourage you. Jesus was there as well. If you've ever been hurt because your family disregarded you or said mean things about you or didn't care for you or wasn't there when you needed them the most, Jesus has been there as well. His own family was his biggest resistance at that point. Jesus knows his days are numbered. Death is coming and his family doesn't support him. And again, they didn't oppose him. They didn't hate him. They weren't mean to him. They weren't cruel to him. They kept pursuing him. They kept speaking to him. They kept trying to help him, trying to love him, trying to serve him. But they didn't fully understand what God had called them to do. Sometimes family members are the last people to see who you are and what God is making you. Sometimes the last people that will see the calling of God in your life are the people that are closest to you. I remember when I was called into ministry, the people that gave me the largest pushback was not my immediate family, but my extended family. They're like, you want to be a pastor? What's wrong with you? Right? And they were the ones who discouraged me the most from pursuing what God had called me. And the challenge with Jesus' family was Jesus had no sin. For me, who was a sinner, and my cousins and extended family that knew that I was a sinner, I could hear what they were saying. Hey, you're a screw-up, right? You don't deserve to be a pastor. But Jesus didn't sin. His whole life was perfect. His family was still unwilling to see him for who he was. Not based on anything that he's done. And it was hard. Ladies, it's hard for you to picture your son as God. Right? You're like, I changed his diaper and now you're telling me to worship him? I'm not doing that. Any of you have a brother? Like many of us, they might warm up to Jesus over time. They love him. They respect him. They appreciate things about him. But if my brother ever claimed to be God, I'd be like, you're out of your mind. You're insane. Some of you are like that. You know a little bit about Jesus. Maybe you try to be a good person. You believe a little bit about the Bible. You don't hate Jesus. You're not opposed to Jesus. But you're not convinced yet that he's God. You're warming up in the process just like his family was. And so the story continues that James doubted Jesus. John is one of the most significant gospels to give us insight into the thinking of Jesus' brothers. In John 2, they were with him at the wedding feast in Cana where Jesus performs his first miracle where he turns water into wine. And they've seen him do some incredible things. They've seen him do miraculous things. They're traveling with him at some points of his ministry. And you jump over to John 7. They're with him at this feast of boots. 
It's like, it's like a holiday, like Christmas or Thanksgiving or Easter, and the family gets together. It's a celebration. And his brothers basically mock him. So his brothers say to him, the brothers are all together now. They're like-minded. They're thinking the exact same thing. They approach to Jesus. They say to him, hey, why don't you leave here? Why don't you leave Judea? Why don't you go into the cities and show the world what you're doing? Because no one keeps in secret the things that you do. You should do it openly. Listen, they're mocking him. They're basically saying, you know, if you really are something big, why are you doing it here in Judea? Why don't you go in the big areas and do miracles so that everyone can see? You think you're a big deal? Get out of Judea. You think you're God? You think you're Lord? You think you're Savior? You think you're Christ? Go to the big cities. Go into the public areas. Go preach in the big crowds. Show the world. Go for it. Expose yourself to the world. Let them see you. You ever reach a point with someone where you're at that point of disagreement and you're like, you know what? I'm tired of arguing. You just do what you want to do. That's almost like what the brothers are doing here. Like, we've tried to convince you that you're not God. You're not listening. Why don't you just go do it? Go. Leave us. And that's the heart of what they're saying here. You're God? You're creator? You're savior? Go. Go tell everyone. Some of you look at your own family and you're like, man, I have a hard family. You're not alone. Jesus had a devote, good, godly family. But even a good, devote, godly family has moments of failure where they discourage you or oppose you. So did Jesus. I love the humanity in this. I love that the whole family isn't just walking around with halos over their head in Scripture, that everything was perfect. I love the fact that they're real people with real doubts in a real process that they eventually come to a real faith in a real Jesus. I love the fact that the Bible is the most honest book that was ever written. And what happens is Jesus does leave town. He goes to a big city and he preaches and teaches that he's God and he does miracles and Jesus does it all and because of that he's arrested and tried for this claim that he's God. And if you're here and you're not a Christian, you need to understand this, that Jesus was put to death because he claimed to be God. The leaders saw that as an offense to their political leadership, the religious leadership, and they agreed together. And the Bible says that those who were Jewish and those who were Gentile, those who were Roman, everyone agreed that this guy needed to die. He keeps saying he's God, he's God, he needs to die. And they come to arrest him and Jesus says, why do you arrest me? And the answer was, because you, a mere man, claimed to be God. That was the answer that they gave him, that Jesus claimed to be God. Listen, if you're here, you have to address this at some point in your life. You have to wrestle with this. You can't ignore this forever. Jesus said he was God. He repeated that over and over. His family was resistant initially to that, and others opposed him. Ultimately, they murdered him because he said he was God. And that claim is either true or false. It's not made by any other founder of any other major religion. Jesus alone stands, Jesus stands alone in that category to claim that he's God. And at the death of Jesus, who was there when he was beaten and flogged and murdered? The Bible tells us that at the foot of the cross was his mother, Mary. There was his mother. Imagine the horror of that day. Your firstborn son, a miracle spoken to you by angels from heaven dying on the cross you held him you counted his ten fingers his ten toes you tickled his belly button you weren't thinking that he would ever be nailed to a Roman cross your son is being murdered publicly openly shamefully because of his claim that he was God you feared this day was coming that's why you got your family together to rescue Jesus from the crowd. You feared that this was going to be Jesus' fate. I don't think it's unreasonable to assume that his family was also there. I mean, if your day of execution came and your mother was there, you sure would hope that your brothers and sisters were there for mom as well. And Jesus is there murdered. He's crucified. And then he's wrapped up in linens and spices and he's put in the tomb. 
His family knows he's dead. Mary is devastated. Sisters are destroyed. And the brothers are distraught. Family is weeping. And the brothers are trying to encourage Mary, love their sisters, and make sense of their brother's death. The family has a funeral. And they shed their tears and they mourn their loss. And then three days later, something unprecedented in history happens, vindicating everything Jesus said and everything Jesus did. Jesus rises from the dead. Jesus alone conquers death. The wages of sin is death. But because Jesus had no sin, death was not able to hold him down. This is the most magnificent, unprecedented, epic event in the history of humanity. Jesus rises from the dead. And Paul records in 1 Corinthians what happens then. 1 Corinthians 15, he says he appeared to James and then to the apostles. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine the reunion between James and his big brother Jesus? I don't know what it looked like. James opens the door and all of a sudden Jesus is standing there with his nail-scarred hands. And he's, he's like, I'm back. I conquered death. I told you I was God. And Jesus is like, okay, I believe you now. Right? Wherever James was on that continuum of faith, this is where the switch got completely flipped. He's fully in now. Jesus is God. Everything he said is true. He's my creator. He's my substitute. He's my savior. I'm all in. I'm fully in. James appeared to be hot or cold and in and out until Jesus is risen. And now all of a sudden they have this face-to-face -face reunion and James is steaming hot now. Let me say this as well. Some people will teach that Jesus never died. That someone who looked like Jesus died. Maybe a body double or a stunt double. Um, you know who would know? Jesus' family would know. You can fool a lot of people, but you can't fool a guy's mom, and you can't fool a guy's siblings. James saw it with his own eyes. James' testimony for us is credible, historical, truthful. Jesus raised, rose from the dead, and he had this reunion with his brother James, and his James' life is changed completely. Friends, I want you to receive Jesus as risen from the dead. And I want you to change as we go through this series. My prayer is that you would be captured by Jesus and you would change wherever you are on the continuum of faith. I want you to come to a place where James arrives and says that he is God. He is worth pursuing more than anything. He rose from the dead. He's my God. He's my Savior. This is one of the most incredible historical evidences for the resurrection of Jesus. And James becomes a leader, a pastor, a teacher, and ultimately a martyr for his faith. The only thing that will account for this radical transformation is that Jesus really did rise from the dead. See, if someone dies, we tend not to devote our life to them as God. We tend not to follow in their footsteps and pattern ourselves after their example. Often we will mourn their loss, and then after a season of mourning, we'll move on. But not James. In fact, James joins the early church. We see that in Acts 1, where 120 people gather together, and it's recorded that they gathered together, and his family was there. They gathered in one accord. There's unity. They were devoting themselves to ongoing, habitual prayer together with the women. And who was there? Mary the mother of Jesus, his brothers were there. Who were the first converts? Who was the first core group in the church plant in Jerusalem? Who were the first people to sign up to become Jesus followers? It was his own family, his mother, his brothers. Do you feel the weight of that? They didn't believe him until he rose from the dead. This was a devout Jewish family. Think about the most devout family that you can think of. Maybe a devout Jew or a devout Muslim. They're doing it right. They're following the rules. They're obeying their, their God. They're doing what they're supposed to do and put Mary and, Joseph, Mary and the brothers in their shoes. Every indication was Jesus' family was very devout. Mary and Joseph, devout Jewish people. They make their pilgrimage to the temple. They offer sacrifices for those who are poor. They're devout people. 
They know the Ten Commandments. The first commandment is, there's only one God. The second is, you shall worship that God. And they're not like people who dabble in spirituality. Let's try this today. Let's try that tomorrow. They're not like that. They're devout. And all of a sudden, they worship Jesus, their brother, their son, as God. Jesus' own mother worships him as God. Jesus' own brothers worship him as God. That's amazing. That's powerful. Like I said before, none of us would worship our siblings, says God. If you would pick anyone on earth, the last person would be your brother or your sister. You know the horrible things they've done. You know the sins of your family. You know their failures. You know their flaws. You know their faults. And yet, Jesus' family now worships him as God. And in addition to all that, James and his brother Jude, they become powerful pastors. Jude 1, he also says, I am a servant of Jesus, not boasting, but he's a brother of Jesus, humble servant. He was the brother of, of James. Mary and Joseph had quite a family. They raised Jesus, James, and Jude. One of their sons is the whole point of the entire Bible. The other two sons wrote books of the Bible. Pretty amazing family. Listen, some of you need to hear this this morning. The most amazing ministry you will ever do in your life is not what you do in here. It's in how you raise your family. It's in how you pour into the lives of your children. You can be humble. You can never be on stage. You can be hardworking. You can be blue collar. And yet you can be used by God to raise children, point them to Jesus, and you have no idea what God can do through your faithfulness in raising your children. We don't know a lot about Joseph, but everything we know, we can know by looking at his family. We know a little bit more about Mary, but everything we need to know, we know by looking at her family. The grace of God through the Holy Spirit at work through this mother and father led to servants of God that were amazing who have written books of our, of our Holy Scriptures. This is a family that's worth modeling after by the grace of God. These men have such authority that they begin to write books of the Bible, James and Jude. We hear a lot about Paul. We hear a lot about Peter. We don't hear a lot about Jesus' brothers. And you can add Jude to that list. It's a very large family with a lot of brothers, sisters, and the story continues. In Acts 15, there is a gathering of a group of leaders, and it's the most, probably the most important meeting in the history of the church. Jesus was Jewish. His family was Jewish. And they were waiting for this Old Testament Messiah. They converted to worshiping Jesus, and they now follow him as Jewish converts. And then Christianity begins to spread all over the region and Gentiles begin to get saved and they get to be filled with the Holy Spirit and they begin to worship God, Jesus as God. And the question now arises in the church, what do you do with these Gentiles? And it was a big question. It would have been a question that would have split the church in half. A lot of the New Testament is dedicated to answering this question. Was, the question was, do the men need to get circumcised? Because... We did. Do they need to? And like, we don't know. We're not sure. Let's talk about it. And they're like, do they, are they allowed to still eat pork? They're like, we don't know. We don't. They still do. Let's talk about it. And so they convened this meeting in Jerusalem. Jerusalem was the mother church. Jerusalem was the headquarters, the resources, the training, the authority went out from Jerusalem. And people who were spiritual leaders across the various churches, they came to Jerusalem. And one of the ways that you know that someone has significant spiritual authority is if they have convening power. And so when the meeting is called, not everyone is going to go. But if a meeting is called in Jerusalem, key leaders were going to show up. Peter was there. Paul was there. Timothy was there. Titus was there. Barnabas was there. These are guys who are traveling, planting churches. Most of these guys were traveling all over the place, but Peter and James stayed in Jerusalem. Peter was the leader of Jesus' disciples. They stayed in Jerusalem. They oversaw the church plants. They nourished all of these plants that were going on. And when controversy erupts, they gather together and say, we need a meeting. Everyone come to Jerusalem, and they sit down, and we're going to figure out what is God's will for the Gentiles. You need to see in the New Testament there were levels of spiritual leadership 
and spiritual authority. Not everyone went to this meeting. It wasn't a congregational vote. They didn't just decide on majority vote, but they sat. They prayed. They sought God's will. They tried to figure out what God's will is for the Gentile converts. And they're doing so in Jerusalem, which is overseen by Peter and James. This is one of the most important meetings in the history of the world. Our fate is at stake. Those of us who are Gentiles, well, here's what we read in Acts 15. In the middle of that meeting, in verse 12, 13, the assembly falls silent. They listen to Barnabas. They listen to Paul talking about all the signs and wonders that God is doing in the Gentile world, and all of a sudden they're quiet. Peter's there. And it's hard to argue that anyone had more spiritual authority than Peter appointed by Jesus to lead. And they give a report. God's doing incredible things. People are coming to faith. Gentiles are meeting Jesus. They're repenting of their sin. They're falling in love with the God of the Bible. Everyone's quiet. And there's this dramatic pause. And in one of the most important meetings in the history of the world, the question is, who will stand up and speak for God? Who will the Holy Spirit speak through? And after this silence, James, Jesus' brother, stands up. And he says, brothers, listen to me. Paul, listen to me. Barnabas, listen to me. Peter, listen to me. Do you sense the weight of that? I don't have that kind of authority. I doubt if I would even be invited into that room. If I was, I'd be the one cleaning up the plates of the people that ate, right? That would be my role in that room. James does. And James begins to teach through the Old Testament. And James, in that critical moment in the history of the church, leads the church. James sets the trajectory, along with Peter and Paul and Barnabas, and the Holy Spirit brings them to unity of mind regarding God's will for the Gentile converts. Here's why I tell you that. We're going to spend three months looking together at the book of James. And his word over and over is, listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. And friends, if Peter was willing to listen, if Paul was willing to listen, if Barnabas was willing to listen, and they're willing to listen to James, then you and I, we need to be willing to listen to the words of James as he teaches us. If they were willing to sit under his spiritual authority, these are men who have written books of the Bible and they were under his authority. We need to as well. Story continues. One more story. Paul speaks of James in his letter to the Galatians. In Galatians 1, he says, After three years, I went up to Jerusalem. Again, convening power. Paul comes and speaks with James. Think of a meeting. Think about a meeting between Paul and Peter. And this meeting lasts for about 15 days. And it's quite a meeting. And Paul says that I saw none of the other apostles except James, the brother of Jesus. James, Jesus' brother. Paul submits to the authority of James and Peter. When you and I read the New Testament, the guy who's written more books than the Bible named Paul is, is Paul. And Paul wasn't just in authority, but he was also under authority. Repeatedly in Acts, and this happens on more than one occasion, and it's reported here in Galatians that Paul makes this journey to Jerusalem so that he could sit down and basically get a performance review from James you see that? Paul, who's planting churches everywhere. Paul, who's being, tra- who's being used by God to transform cities for the gospel. He consistently goes back to James, and James and Peter pour into him so that pe- he can continue doing what God has called him to do. We haven't considered James enough in church. We haven't honored James enough. He's often overlooked. He's not received the kind of regard that is worthy of being of everything that the Bible says about him. And so I'm excited that we get to do that. And I want you to see him for who he is. A bold preacher, a teacher, a writer of the Bible, a leader of our faith, working for the most important church, feeding, nourishing other churches, other leaders, men like Paul, that they would travel hundreds of miles so that they could be poured into. It's magnificent that James wrote a book for us and that we get to sit down with Peter, with Paul, and we get to learn from him as these guys did.
in Galatians 2, Paul says he met with James and Peter and John. And he calls them pillars. James is Jesus' brother. Peter is the leader of Jesus' disciples. And John is basically Jesus' best friend. The one that Jesus looks down at the cross and says, Hey, John, take care of my mom. You're basically family now. No one closer relationally to Jesus than John. And Peter, James, and John, Paul says, they're a pillar. And these are a nickname that Paul gives them. They're pillars. You know what a pillar does? It carries a load. I have, when we were building this building, I was like, I want to tear this pole down. And the landlord was like, you can't. Because if you take that wall down, that pole down, this whole building will fall on us. It carries the load. That's what Peter, James, and John are doing. They're load-bearing. They carry the burden of the church. He says they're pillars. They're like marble columns to the temple. They're going to be here next year. They're going to be here the year after that. They don't move. They're rock solid. They can handle a load. They're pillars. What an incredible nickname. We can use men like that. We can use women like that. Perceived by the grace that was given to me that we would be pillars. That we would be men and women who are so strong in our faith that we're reliable. That we are trustworthy. That we are consistent day in and day out. What happens to James? He continues to preach. He continues to teach. And it's reported historically apart from, f- away from Scripture that he was murdered. He was martyred around AD 62, 63. So Jesus' little brother stays in Jerusalem. He stayed the course. He was a rock-solid pillar. He didn't move. He didn't crumble. He didn't tumble. He didn't waver. You know, the church history, they give, in addition to pillar, they gave him a couple other nicknames. One one passage calls him James the Just. What a nickname. The Just Guy. He was always fair in how he dealt with people. But the other nickname that they gave him was Camel Knees. You know where they got that from? Because he was a man who fervently sought Jesus with everything that he had. He would be on his knees seeking God's face. He knew that his life would influence other people. He knew that he was a man that just his life could make a difference in another person's faith. And he didn't do it by himself. He was consistently on his knees crying out to Jesus for help. So here's a pillar, a righteous man, always on his knees in prayers to Jesus. And that's where he was when they came to murder him. History says that he was praying when they came and took him away. History tells us they took, a, they took Paul, P, James to the top of the temple This is supposed to be God's house, overshadowing the coming of Jesus, the presence of God, the sacrifice, the priest. It's all about Jesus. And they came and they take James to the top of the temple. The religious leaders do. The same group that tried to kill Jesus. Religious leaders are sometimes the worst. They murder Jesus and he rises from the dead and they don't get it. And so they go after Jesus' followers and they take James to the top of the temple and they throw him down openly, publicly, shamefully. They try to murder him. And the history says they hit the ground, but apparently James is a pretty tough guy and he doesn't die. So they run down from the top of the temple and they stone him to death. And the family has another funeral. Mary, Mary has to bury another son. And history records that the person that succeeds James as the leader of the church in Jerusalem was one of his own brothers. What a family. Kill one brother another brother rises up. And that guy's name is Simeon or Simon. What an amazing family. This family is utterly convinced that Jesus is God, Jesus is Savior, that Jesus rose. You can kill us, but we'll go see him. It's going to be okay. Listen, if you're here and if you're not a follower of Jesus, I've got to ask you, how in the world do you account for something like that? What motive would they possibly have? There was no fame in it. There was no glory in it. There was no fortune to be made in it. There was death and there was suffering because they were going to lose their lives for following Jesus. 
but it didn't bother them one bit because they knew following Jesus was worth it. I'll close with these words of Jesus. In Mark 3.35, when his brothers and sisters came to, his brother and his mother came to see him, Jesus said, who is my brother? Who is my mother? And then Jesus answered his own question. He said, whoever does the will of God is my brother and my sister and my mother. How many of you here are like, man, it would be great to have Jesus as a big brother? And Jesus is like, I'll be your big brother. I am your big brother. Do what I tell you to do. I'll be your big brother. I'll love you. I'll help you. I'll encourage you. I'll be there for you. I'll be your big brother. How many of you moms are like, man, I would love to have Jesus as a son. He's always perfect. I'll never have to yell at him. And Jesus says, I'll love you like I love my mom if you'll obey me and tell me what, and do what I tell you to do. Here's Jesus inviting you into his family. You may not have been born into his family, but you can be born again by the Spirit of God into the family of God. And brothers, Jesus is like a big brother to us, putting his arm around us. And to each of us, he says this morning, he says, listen, we have stuff to do. Look at James. Look at Jude. And he puts around his arms around each of us, and he says, I'm your big brother. Sisters, keep going. We need you on the team. You're important. You're not just on the sidelines. Young folks, old folks, we need you. You're a big deal. You've got stuff to do. In the book of James, when you read this letter, you'll discover it's almost the entire book is in the present tense. Do this, do this, do this, do that, do this. Because the family of God is seen by the works of God. If you're here and you're not a Christian, the first thing you need to do is to turn from your sin and follow Jesus. You need to cross that line of faith that James and his family crossed. They went from knowing him, knowing a little bit about him, kind of liking him, being concerned about other things, to finally becoming full, fully devoted followers of Jesus. You cannot just admire Jesus, but he wants you to be a part of the family. And you do that by turning from your sin and trusting in Jesus. For those of you who are followers of Jesus this morning, the book of James is written largely to church-going folks who knew a lot, but they weren't doing a lot. So James is trying to convince this church to move from conviction to action, from belief to behavior. And my question for you today would be, what is Jesus commanding you to do? What is the Holy Spirit speaking to you to, and encouraging you to do, but you keep saying no to? What is his will for your life? What's on the to-do list that you're saying, I need to do this for Jesus, but you just keep pushing it off? Some of you in this room are like, I don't feel close to Jesus like a brother. I don't feel close to Jesus at all. And maybe what you'll discover as we go through this series is Maybe you don't feel close to Jesus just because you're not really serving him. You're just simply gathering and going, and that's about it. And life isn't coming because you're not engaging in what God has called you to do. Maybe you're not working when he's working. Maybe you're not obeying where he's commanding. And it's not that he's not far from you. Maybe it's just you're not in sync with him. And so can I invite you this morning if Jesus is speaking to you to get reconnected, to be obedient, would you just do it? Would you obey? Would you trust Jesus?